This is Friday, October 20th, 2017. We are in Canton, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Ziesel Kopeka? Kopeka. Kopeka Gravitz. Welcome, Ziesel. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born 1921, September 29th. And where were you born? In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And what community do you currently live in? I live in Canton in a retirement community, Massachusetts. Your marital status? A widow. Do you have children? Yes, I do. Two children. <laughs> and how many grandchildren? And I have six grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. Good for you. Tell us a bit about uh, Philadelphia growing up. Growing up in Philadelphia was fun. I, had, I went to um, a public grammar school but it was more like a magnet school where children came from all over the city of Philadelphia. And it was next to the normal school where the uh, people were trained to be teachers. So in our classes, we had two student, two normal school students plus a teacher until the sixth grade. After that, I went to a public school and walked uh, from where I live to school and back. And then in high school, I went to girls' high school, Philadelphia High School for Girls. And what did your father do for a living? My father was a physician, a family physician, who adored his practice, his patients, and just lived to be a, just to be a great doctor. And did you have siblings? Yes, I had a sister. I have a sister, Wilma, who's five years younger than I am, and a brother who was eight years younger than I by the name of Saul. And while you were in school, were you made aware of events happening in Europe and Asia? Definitely, yes. We were very tuned in. And... Um, I was supposed, it, I graduated high school in 1938, and at that time I was supposed to take a, a graduation trip to Europe, and my father said it was not to be, that he expected war to break out in Europe, so I was not allowed to go. And what did you do after high school? After high school, I went to University of Pennsylvania for four years. I was pre-med, chemistry major, and um, learned to associate with the male sex as well as the female <laughs> sex. Do you remember what happened on December 7th, 1941? Definitely. Okay. I sure do. I was a friend, I had a good friend, Ben Lieber from Scranton, Pennsylvania, who came that weekend to visit with me, and we were at the museum. And we came, I went with Ben to meet with my father in his office, and it was a Sunday, my father had office hours. And when we got to his office, he said he had terrible news that uh, the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was located? Sure. Mm -hmm. Hawaii. Hawaii. And what were you thinking at that time? Shocked. Mm -hmm. Shocked that it was Hawaii, Japanese, and not the Europeans. Although I knew that Roosevelt um, had a Lend-Lease program with um, England, and uh, but shocked, as the new word is, stunned. Stunned it is. So you were a senior at Penn. Tell us what happened. You, I know you graduated. 
I graduated in 38. Mm -hmm. And no, I graduated high school in yeah, 38. Mm -hmm. And I graduated Penn in 42. And what did I, what was the question? Uh, what, were, what did you do after you graduated from Penn? Uh, a week after I graduated from Penn, I was down at the Philadelphia Navy Yard working as a chemist in their chem lab, a chem lab, which was on the second floor directly above the torpedo lab. But these were torpedoes that were being built by the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Uh, they were just the shells below us that were, yes, <laughs> that were being put together and manufactured. And what kind of chemistry were you working with? <sighs> I, at, at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, I was doing some research, which is really qualitative chemistry, and I worked on fluxes with a wonderful man who was a PhD and a few other people with with me, and um, we wanted to determine what fluxes to use with what metals, because the Navy building ships, it was very important that the flux be the proper welding material to put the two sheets of metal together. These were ships that were built very quickly, so they there were no uh, studs, there were no nails. It was all welded. Uh -huh. That's why they broke apart World War II. Mm -hmm. Some of them. But thankfully not all of them. No. Nope. <laughs> How long did you work in Philadelphia at the Navy Yard? I worked from June until January of 43 when I joined the Waves. And I was sent to Smith College officers training. Okay, let's do, take a half step back. Why, what made you uh, decide to join the waves? Basically, I'm being, first I'll be facetious. Mm -hmm. I joined the waves so that at the present time, at my age, I get my medications from the VA. But that's being facetious. Mm -hmm. I joined the waves really because I really uh, wanted to see what the world was like. I was also a chemist, so I could replace other the men for sea duty, and um, I just wanted to be away from home. I'd been home all my life. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see what the world was about. So was this your first trip out of Philadelphia? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. no. I, I went abroad with my parents in 1931 for three months. And so I knew I had been to Europe, had been to the Far East, up to uh, is Palestine and Egypt, and we traveled all through Europe at that time. Well, but, now, but now it's a different But reason. I wanted to be mm -hmm. on my own. Yep, okay. So now you're in Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Yes, yes. For and off that was a revelation. Okay. Yes, because um, one thing I, I remember vividly was that the girls who came from the South couldn't wait to get up early in the morning to start the morning with their co first Coca-Cola of the day. Sounds funny, but it's true. <laughs> they couldn't wait to get to that Coke machine to wake them up. Ah, uh, cold carbonated caffeine. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but they needed it. <laughs> Did you get along with the other uh, trainees? Very much so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've always gotten along with people. And um, I did have a, a mishap. 
Uh, when I was at Smith College that year in 1943, the temperature in January, the temperature was below 26 degrees, to z zero, below uh, 26 degrees. So I got frostbite, frostbitten. And because of that, I was driven with two other girls from class to class and for dinners and, and food at... Uh, and uh, that was not that was not a happy time. As of now, I still have frostbite. Mm. It's now a neuropathy, mm. but that was the way it was then. We were not equipped with the proper uh, clothing at the time. How long were you at uh, Smith College? Uh, I think. It was at least nine weeks. Nine weeks. And during that period, I, there was an older woman, because I was young. I was kind of 20, just 21. Mm -hmm. And there was an older woman who um, kind of sorted me out and asked me, did I want to join the Marines? because the, the women were now going into the Marines. And I, as an officer, and she was going to head the whole Marine, female Marine uh, group. And I thought to myself, no, I don't like the khaki uniform. And this is the truth. I just don't like it, and I won't look good in it. And besides which, they're going to send me to California or wherever there's a Marine base. And I'm not sure I want to be with Marines and all. So I turned her down. Whether that was good or bad, now, I don't know. One will never know. And what, uh, what was like the curriculum during those nine weeks? It was very interesting. Uh, we had uh, a lot of math. And we had uh, a lot of recognition of different parts of what the Navy is like. Ships and um, all kinds of instruments, et cetera, et cetera. And we just had to study and learn and take exams. It was it's the way it was, just like school. Did you do any kind of drill? You know, Drilling? Well, yeah. Hated it. Aha! <laughs> Hated it. Mm -hmm. I'm not formal. I had to march in uniform, with, in uniform with everybody else. And so maybe getting frostbite was a good thing. Who knows? <laughs> Nine weeks later, you get your commission as yes. in. And then I'm on a, plane, a train. To the naval to uh, to Washington and then to the Naval Academy, and on the train I met another wave who was also going to be stationed at the Naval Academy, and uh, we became very good friends. Her name was Melba Graphius. She was a uh, pharmacist, and so we ended up in the chemistry lab at the Naval Academy together. And there was another wave already stationed there in the chem lab uh, by the name of Marion Kotko. The three of us became extraordinarily close because we were the only three waves at that time at the, at the academy. And um, subsequently, other women came in whom we became friends with. Okay, now at the time, of course, the Naval Academy, the cadets were all male. Yes. Uh, first of all, where were you bunked? Ah, good question. My, our, we, I looked, I mean, I checked and looked and there was a, a young woman who's, actually she was from Syria and her husband was a, uh, a naval officer, and she rented a house right down at the dock, and um, she had rooms for rent, 
And so I rented one of her rooms and I was permitted to use her refrigerator in the kitchen. After that, after, uh, and Melvia, Melba did too, the two of us. After that, we met another woman whose husband was also in the service, who also rented rooms. And her name was Mrs. Peach. And we decided that this was a better way for us to live. And, and it was it, it was uh, not at the at the front of the uh, of the river, and it was a, a nicer location. So both of us went and lived in her uh, rented rooms from her. Um, it's funny all these names. That <laughs> after Mrs. Peach, uh, she had been a school. She was a school teacher, and her husband was off somewhere. Um, we rent, I rented a house, uh, 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 not a house, a uh, another room from Mrs. Bean. And she had a wonderful dog we called Beanie. <laughs> and uh, it was lovely. It was a lovely place. Okay. Now let's get uh, to some of the more mundane details First of all, what kind of uniform were you wearing while you were in the chem lab? Were you wearing your whites, your work clothes? No work. We were just wearing uniforms. Okay. We, there were no, uh, no special clothing for the chem lab. Not even a lab coat? No lab coat. No. Not chemistry. Huh. No. What happens if you spilled something? Too yes. bad. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't supposed to spill anything. <laughs> Too <All> right. bad. <laughs> Did you have a single issue of uniform or, no, or two issues just in case? We had to pay for our uniforms. Really? Yes. It, you know, if you're an officer, it's one thing. If you're enlisted as a, as a just, a, um, you know, as a, a, wave, a, a wave, but not not an officer, you were supplied with your, with your uniforms. Okay, so you have your living arrangements, you have your uniforms. Uh, yes, Isaac made mm -hmm. the uniforms. They were from Philadelphia again. They were tailors, mm -hmm. and uh, they made uniforms for most of the officers in the Navy throughout the country. I'm kind of curious about this. Um, Sort of like your accessories, like uh, shoes, shoes, stockings. Did you have to pay out of pocket for those? Everything Every was out of pocket. Yes. And were you subject to rationing? At least no. as far as the clothing. No. No. Okay. No. No food. No. No rationing. No. Mm -hmm. I don't remember a ration book. And what were the, uh, were you like working nine to five? It, at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, I had a double shift, a shift from eight to four and four to eight. Women did not work eight to 12 or from 12 to eight, whatever. Uh, at the Naval Academy, it was nine to five. And what, was there any specific chemistry program you were working on while at the academy? Well, I was working on fluxes at the time, but it was because I'd had that experience at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. So I, was, I knew enough to work, um, at, but this was, um, oh, I forget the word. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, it was not research, it was just working and, and just, um, there's a word for it. Okay, go ahead. I've forgotten it. <laughs> well, maybe it'll come back to you. It'll come back. Okay, so you're still in fluxes at the academy. Mostly. Mostly? At, 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 yes. You're one of a handful of women at an all-male well, academy. In an all-male academy. Mm -hmm. But we did have some uh, um, people, who, women who work with us, who had no experience, but they were, they just helped us. Mm -hmm. They were just 
helpers. They wash dishes, I mean, they wash the uh, beakers and things of that sort. Did you have a chance to interact with the, can uh, with the cadets? Or the middies, I should say. As it happens, yes. Uh, it's a good question. Um, my husband-to-be's brother was stationed for a while at the academy as a midshipman. He, was an in he graduated Tufts as an engineer, but he was sent down to the academy for further training. So I knew of him, and I knew, and so we were friends, and um, I, I would invite him, which was not a, the right thing to do, but we, we did have a friendship together as friends. So he was a midshipman. I was an officer. We weren't supposed to do that, but we did. And what was your rank at the time? I went in as an ensign, and uh, I eventually ended up being a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And um, if I had stayed in the Navy three months later, I would have been a lieutenant commander. Now, how long were you stationed at the Naval Academy? At the Naval Academy, I was stationed for 15 months. Um, the reason I didn't stay was because I had had a, um, I had, uh, had a, a tooth removed by a, a wisdom tooth, and I had uh, a severe reaction. And um, I was very ill. And uh, after I got better, I didn't want to stay at the academy. It was just pa too painful, for one thing. Secondly, I'm not formal. And so every time I walked the grounds of the academy or went, the, mid the midshipman had to salute me. And I, it was enough. It was enough. And I did have a lieutenant commander, my superior, who used to say to me, Lieutenant Kapika, the more you want to leave, the more you're going to stay. And I just couldn't stay. So I met an admiral in Washington, a rear admiral, retired, who restationed me in Philadelphia. And I worked for the Office of Procurement and, Ma and Management under directly under Secretary Forrestal, and I did expediting, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Before the interview, you are telling me what you were procuring and expediting, and uh, one of the items had to do with? President Roosevelt. And what and did I've, he want? <laughs> he needed a square tub for his presidential plane, and luckily enough, I found one for him in the Philadelphia area. And then he, the Navy wanted um, rubber matting for his trip to, with Ibn Sayyid on a ship. Forgot the name of the ship. Anyhow, um, I found white rubber matting for him at the time. Mm -hmm. And you weren't aware that he had was, I didn't know. Yeah. I was not aware why he needed the square tub. That he was basically Subsequently, yeah. yeah, found out that he was, yes. Okay. So maybe this is a good time to talk about your husband. Oh. Yes. How did you meet and when? Well, we met on a blind date, actually. And he was in dental school, and I was, that was, I had just graduated college. Yeah. And um, he, he graduated dental school in October. It was a short, instead of four years, three and a half. And he was sent down to Camp Hood and became um, part of a anti-tank uh, destroyer outfit as a dentist and medic and um, 
He was sent a little after D-Day to Europe with his group, Sandy Tank group. He went all through France. He went through the Battle of the Bulge. He, his group liberated two death camps and he came home very hostile. And we now remember, we now think he came home with PTSD, uh, but it wasn't diagnosed then. We didn't know what it was. And what was your husband's name? Sidney Gravitz. And when did you get married? We were married September 15th, 1946. Right after the war? Yes. Okay, let's get you back to the Office of Procurement. Yes. Was there any other unusual items that had to be got, gotten out yesterday? Oh, lots. Mm -hmm. there, it was all telex. We had it six offices around the country. We're a very small group of officers. Most, the male officer, oh, just to tell you how, I, because I was a female in the office, there was one other, Millicent Sturm, another uh, wave with me. But the two of us, we were required, absolutely required, to make coffee for the male officers. <laughs> but none of, we just didn't feel like, we, we didn't feel anything that was so bad, but it would be now at the present. Um, we were, um, oh, how can I explain it? Uh, the telex would come in and uh, given to Millicent or me, and then we'd just get right on the telephone. We had telephone books from, um, from New northern New Jersey down to Baltimore and as far west as, um, oh, not Pittsburgh, but pretty far west. Mm -hmm. And wherever we could find anything, we were on the phone all day long looking for things. Mostly uh, T-bars, H-bars, a lot. Uh, Radio Shack was, was not Radio Shack at the time, mm -hmm. but that started in Philadelphia, and I got a lot of, of uh, electrical products from Radio Shack. And after the war, I had two offers for, for a job to work. One with the man who developed Radio Shack, and also, uh, I forgot the name of, this, of the metal. They were on the big board. And they offered me a job as well, because I knew a lot about hmm. scrap metal. I know the uh, those who were who, like the younger set, were probably watching this interview, probably wondering why didn't you send email? <laughs> <laughs> Telex was our thing. <laughs> Telex was your thing. <laughs> mm. We thought that was great. <laughs> uh -huh. And tell us a little bit about um, general life in the area during the mid '40s. For example, uh, did you and your uh, future husband keep in touch by letters? Yes, mm -hmm. we did write a lot of letters. And I did write a lot of letters to some of the people I, some of the boys I knew mm -hmm. and were friendly with overseas. Um, and I received letters from them as well. And, um, <laughs> I'll t personally, there's one incident I remember. It was world. It was New Year's Eve, and this wonderful young man invited me to a New Year's Eve movie. And his name was Phil Lyson. I'll never forget. He subsequently went to medical school, um, and he. Um, I kept calling him Sydney all night, not mm -hmm. Philip because it was the Battle of the Bulge. And I knew that Sydney was in the battle, <laughs> was in that area. And mm. I just, 
I've, I've been embarrassed to this day. <laughs> well, oh, Philip and Sydney would both forgive you. <laughs> so, you know, that was my next question, whether you went to the movies, listened to the radio. Oh, we always listened to the radio. Mm -hmm. What were your favorite programs? Heavens above, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, golly. Did you like uh, music, comedy? Oh, always music. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I was, it was 25 cents to go hear a Philadelphia orchestra in Philadelphia if you sat upstairs at the top level. Which we did very, which I did very often. The nosebleed seats. <laughs> Those seats, yes. And I was always into music and opera, but so was Sidney. He would walk into the house, and the first thing that he would do was turn on the radio and listen to classical music, always. And we were big opera goers, very big opera. And he was a supernumerary for many years with the Philadelphia, with the Metropolitan Opera Company in New York, when they came to Philadelphia on Tuesdays, Tuesday nights, with all their trappings. And he was a supernumerary from high school on, even to the years that we lived in Florida with the Florida Opera Company. Well, let's get back to you in uniform for just a little while longer. First of all, do you remember uh, when Roosevelt died? No, not really. What I do remember is the train ride and Mrs. Roosevelt, Truman. I know that we were all very upset. But he was very ill, mm -hmm. and we all knew it. We all knew he was ill. Did you see the train? I never saw the train, okay. which reminds me. <laughs> Talk about a train. When I first came to the Philadelphia office, uh, they sent me to the Naval Air Station outside, kind of away from the center of the city, mm -hmm. Philadelphia Naval Air Station. And they asked me to, uh, I didn't do well. I just didn't recognize what I should have, the work that I should have done. I didn't understand it. So that didn't work out. And that's why I went back with, to the office, the Fox Building at 16th and Market. But then they asked me to um, do train schedules. Now, certain schedules, meaning that certain um, trains had to arrive at certain places at certain times with certain products. And I just, that was not my thing as well. So I worked on that for about two weeks. But I, I just didn't enjoy it, and they knew it, and so it wasn't my thing. Okay. Do you remember when the Germans surrendered VE Day in May 1945? Hmm. I remember again, but it was movies that I remember, the news. Mm -hmm. Let's move up a bit to August 1945, when something called the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan. I remember that well. Mm -hmm. That I remember very well. It was General Donnelly. I forget his name. Anyhow, mm -hmm. yes, I do remember. Um, before the interview, you mentioned a couple of people. One worked at Oak Ridge and the other on the Manhattan Project. Right. Well, with these two guys who I worked with at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, um, I don't remember their names because I'm not good at names. Mm -hmm. um, he, one went to the Manhattan Project, and the other was inducted into the Navy very fast and sent to Oak Ridge because uh, I guess they needed officers to work with the uh, people working there, and they needed 
I guess they needed more officers than they had. So he was inducted in. And I never heard from either of them afterwards. Um, but I ne but while we were talking about uh, these two men who left, we knew it was something very secretive. We also knew it was something very important. And we also figured out it, it had something to do either with fuel, because we, why ask ship people to work if it, if, you know, uh, to leave and do secretive work if it wasn't fuel or some energy project. That we knew. So now it's the end of the war. When were you discharged from the waves? I left the waves in February of 1946. So what were you doing between the summer and the winter? Well, I went back to school. Mm -hmm. I went back because my father wanted me to go to medical school. And so I went and took uh, organic chemistry during the summer again. Apply, uh, I did go for a medical, uh, uh, for a, uh, an interview, Philadelphia Women's College of Medicine. But I really didn't want to go. I wanted to get married, and I just didn't want to go to medical school. <laughs> I, I, just, I didn't like the sight of blood. My father said, you'll get used to it. You'll get used to it. And I said, no, I don't think I'll ever get used to it. And so <laughs> I married instead. Okay. And what rank uh, were you when you left? A lieutenant? I was a lieutenant. Okay. Senior grade. So now you and husband are married. Yes. And you're living in Philadelphia? Living in, no. No. We lived, my husband opened an, a dental office mm -hmm. out south of Philadelphia in a little town called Woodland, Pennsylvania. And then I got pregnant and I had Ellen mm -hmm. a year later. Uh, oh, I have a story, too. You remind me. When a few, when Ellen was about, um, I guess about a year and a half, uh, I had her in a, out on a coach, and we took a walk. And when I got, we lived in an apartment till we got into a house. But there were steps to this little apartment, garden apartment, and there was this officer sitting on the steps, army officer. And he introduced himself, told me he was from the Army Intelligence Corps. And he asked me about this wave who I was friendly with in Philadelphia who had a Ph.D. in archaeology. She came from Chicago. I forgot her name. And he asked me about her, and, and I told him as much as I knew about the books she read, about the things that, that she was doing. And he then told me that she was working at the Nuremberg Trials. And I, um, he asked me, when was she married um, at any time? And I said, well, I'll never forget this. I said, well, she did tell me she got married, but not to tell anybody because um, she was in the waves at that time and we were not allowed to get married. And so um, she married this Czechoslovakian skier who was in the ski troop, the United States ski troops. And um, it killed me to say it. It really did. I never, I'll never get over it. I couldn't lie. Mm -hmm. 
because she was, they, they needed that information because she was headed for a secret, some s big job of some sort. And she, they needed to find out her, what her background mm -hmm. was. To get clearance. Right. Right. Well, that was a bit of a scary moment, now, wasn't what? it? <laughs> I won't. Uh, there are a lot of things you never forget. There are yes, lots of, really. There's most everything you do forget. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how long were you in South Philly, or at least that part of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? Oh, till I got married, okay. and then I moved down to the, to Woodland. Woodland, Pennsylvania. Chester area. Yeah. Yeah. And how long did you live there? Well, we lived in the Chester area. Then we moved eventually to Rose Valley. Loved that. And I couldn't, because it was, I had frostbite mm -hmm. in the Navy at that, in the beginning. I can't stand the cold. I live here, but I can't stand the cold weather. <laughs> so I told my husband that I was leaving for Florida for the winter. He either came with me, this is 1970 mm -hmm. some, 19, it was 1970. In the meantime, a few years before that, I went back to Penn and did graduate work in philosophy, hoping that I would get a master's and then a doctorate, but that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. It just was too difficult to take care of children, a husband, go to graduate school and all that. So in 1970, I said, I'm moving for a few months to Florida. You'll either come with me or I have to go alone. Well, Sydney had passed the Florida boards, the dental boards. So we, we were supposed to move to Florida, to Florida in, 50, in the 50s. Mm -hmm. But his mother had a total stroke, which mm -hmm. delayed the whole thing. So by the time... It was 1970, Michael Ellen was in med school, Michael was at Yale College. I said, it's time for me to go where there's sunshine and warmth, <laughs> which we did. Yes, you did. Uh, what part of Florida? Well, we looked all over Florida uh, because he had no practice and he needed a practice with two children in college and all that. <laughs> So we decided on North Miami Beach because this was an elderly population and uh, they could afford dentistry. So that's where we started till he retired in 1984. And while you, you're raising your children, your husband's a dentist, did either of you join any military service organizations such as the VFW, the Legion, Auxiliary? Well, the no. 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 Mm -hmm. Not in Florida. No. Um, which reminds me, in junior high school, when they were giving out awards, graduation, I got the American Legion Award. Maybe that helped me decide to go into the service. One never knows. <laughs> All right, so it's now in the mid-80s. Hopefully your children have uh, started on their own paths. Yes. What made you move to Massachusetts? Easily. My oh. daughter is living here. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. And I'm in my 90s, mm -hmm. where Sydney was in his... 90s when we moved, and so was I. And um, they decided that it was time for us to be close to either Michael or Ellen. Well, it's easier to be closer to Ellen than it was in Washington. This was that was more difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, here I am. Here you are. And when did your husband pass? He died in 1912. I mean, your husband. My husband. Your husband. 1915, he died. Oh, I mean, 2015. 
Sorry. Woof. That was a bit of time You're travel. Right. <laughs> You're right. 2050. I'm okay. living in the past. <laughs> I'm living in the past. <laughs> okay. So you have a cap on your table uh, with the Women's Memorial logo. That's right. Yes. Right. Well, I was a fa one of the founders of the Women's Memorial. So I have a cap, and I, I've been a member ever since. It started, a founding member, mm -hmm. and um, tell us a bit about that. It's important to be a, fa a member of Women's Memorial because we're all a special group. We've all volunteered, and um, we helped mm -hmm. develop the service, military service in the country, and we're, it's, a, it's such a bad time to be talking about all this mm -hmm. because of, I hate to say it, because of President Trump. And it just bothers the hell out of me mm -hmm. that we have to put up with this. Mm -hmm. It does. Okay, and for the record, the Women's Memorial is in Washington? Yes. And where exactly in Washington? Well, it's near Arlington, the yeah. cemetery. Okay. It's, it's supposed to, it's really, how, in a sense, kind of like hallowed ground in that whole area. Okay. And um, it's important. Mm -hmm. Cecil, did you ever take advantage of the GI Bill or? Yes. Yes. I did when I went back to mm -hmm. take organic chemistry. Yes. Okay. And of course, you've been ta uh, you've t the VA programs. VA programs. I'm also um, I have a disability, and so mm -hmm. I get a disability from the uh, mm -hmm. government because of the uh, um, because of having a tooth pulled and mm -hmm. almost dying, mm -hmm. and also the fact that I had frostbite. I don't feel mm -hmm. my feet. So, okay, it kind of creeps mm -hmm. as the years go by. Okay, and overall, Cecil, how important was it for you to serve in the military? You know, at the time, I didn't consider it important. No, it was just a thing I wanted to do, and I thought it was the right thing to do, and that I was free to do it, mm -hmm. and healthy enough to do it and young enough. Um, now, I find that it's very important. But when you're young, you don't think of it as important. You just think this is something you should do. And what do you think about uh, women accepting or being accepted more into combat roles? I approve. Mm -hmm. I approve. I was sorry I couldn't be accepted. I really wanted to participate, mm -hmm. but that was, at that time, this was revolutionary just to be admitted. Mm. And before we wrap it up, uh, would you like to say a few words about the International Museum of yes. World War II? Yes. I was just amazed and bewildered because it was such a great collection by one man to have done what he had done what he has done all th and spent his own money obviously to co to collect and create this wonderful museum and now to enlarge it and i think that most i've talked to most people here who don't know anything about the museum but i explained to them i think i'm right that it was a private museum until they he decided to open it up to uh, the outdoor people, uh, to the outside. And um, it's very well worth going, very well. And I'm so happy that he's enlarging it and hopefully be able to help sustain it. 
Cecil, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap things up? No, just that I think it's a worthwhile experience if anyone thinks that they would like to join the, any which service. It's a worthwhile experience, especially for women, because it does change your outlook on life. Mm -hmm. Cecil Gravitz, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>